Hello and welcome to the Ask JP podcast where we go straight at the issues of the day. Today is a, another episode in our ongoing criminal justice reform series. I'm so excited today to have Nandi Campbell, who is a candidate for a judge in criminal district court. Nandi has been a proven champion of the poor and downtrodden in New Orleans. She is not a native here, but was drawn here simply by how broken our public defender system was. She came here in 2008 to take up the public defense of residents contending with a justice system, system shattered by the country's largest natural disaster, handling an average caseload of 200 across 13 sections in criminal court on behalf of the newly restructured and famously busy Orleans Parish Public Defender's Office. In 2009, Nandi launched NFC Law, her own law firm, resulting for, from an assertive lit litigation style, scoring a series of acquittals and appearances of state and federal court on behalf of high profile clients and the title of entrepreneur to her already extensive resume. Today, Nandi is a graduate of Loyola University Institute of Politics and Norman C. Francis Leadership Institute is an associate professor of law at Tulane University and adjunct professor at Loyola University School of Law. She is a contract public attorney for both the Orleans Parish and Federal Eastern District of Louisiana Public Defender's Offices. Nandi, thanks so much for being here today. I'm so excited to get into the issues of the day with you in regards to criminal justice reform. I know that you have been a passionate reformer, and I know you're going to knock these questions out the park. They're all going to seem kind of mundane to you, but, you know, just, just go with me. But now, do you have anything to say before we get started? Um, no, good morning. I'm excited to be here. I, I'm passionate about criminal justice. That's what led me to law school at the age of 33 um, and, and continuing on that path, path of criminal justice. So I'm excited to talk to you about the issues and, and my goals and missions. Okay. Well, first up, why do you want to be a criminal court judge? That's a good question. I wake up every day and say, Nadi, what did you do? Um, so just like when I went to law school at 33, I, I would tell people like, I don't necessarily want to be a lawyer. I really wanted to be a public defender. And, and so it, it dawned on me that in order to be a judge, um, to affect some changes, then I have to do the political part. So the reason I want to be a judge at this stage of my career is that I had the opportunity to observe how things happen in Tulane and Broad. I had an opportunity to observe how things happen in other um, courthouses across uh, Louisiana and in the federal circuit. And I started to think after having a couple of uh, cases where I believe that the judge could have done something differently um, and it would have had a more just outcome. And it was two cases in particular that kind of struck me. Um, one was Jerome Morgan. Um, the Innocent Project had uh, worked really hard on his case and after 20 years in jail, he was granted a new trial. And then they asked me to come aboard um, to try his case. And I remember reading his transcript and, and it, he had a murder trial that lasted one day. And when I say lasted one day, um, that is picking a jury, opening arguments, closing arguments, deliberation, um, and verdict all in one day. And I looked at the actions of the judge who was Leon Canizero and also looked at the actions of his criminal defense attorney. And a lot of times when we think about this case, we talk about um, what the DA did. We, we talk about how bad the defense attorney um, was, but we, we really talk about the inaction of the judge, right? The inaction of the judge to look at this situation and say, something is wrong with this situation. Something is wrong that we have a 17 year old having a murder trial in one day. Did I cross all of my T's and dot my I's to ensure um, that he is, all of his constitutional rights are being upheld. So I, I thought about this, not, this notion of having passive judges, judges who believe that their job is just strictly to just say objection overruled or sustained, right? Or we could have really active judges who understand that their, their job is to make sure um, that defendants get due process um, so that we're not doing it over and over again. So if you think about the amount of money we spent to prosecute a Jerome Morgan the first time, right? And then have 20 years of his life gone to then as taxpayers have to pay again uh, once again to go through this process. So I started thinking about what if we have this criminal justice system where everybody is an active participant and, and active towards one, um, the safety of our community, right? Ensuring um, that our citizens are safe 
And in order to do that, we have to have a criminal justice system that's just. And in order to have that, we have to have active judges actively uh, protecting the criminal justice system, constitutional rights, um, especially if they're being trampled upon by the state and or not being upheld by the defense attorney. Um, and, and that's what got me thinking that um, it's time to make a run um, for, for criminal court judge. Well, and I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm totally going off script here because I have a script of questions, but I'm you, sorry. you said something that's so interesting, <laughs> I want to follow up on it. I've heard from a lot of different candidates that there is, as you know, the Metropolitan Crown Commission ranks judges by how efficient they are and how fast they move their docket. And another candidate, totally different, totally different section made this point. And I think it's, you kind of hit it in the head is that you can't judge judges by how fast they move their docket. Because if, mm -hmm. if, if you've got a complex case with really complex issues, I am sure that under that metric, Leon Canazero was the most effective judge in the history of, of, mm -hmm. of criminal district court. Because, mm -hmm. but and I mean, he tells the numbers. Right. But, but when you think about that as an attorney, Picking a jury and going to trial in the same day, like I was, the, I, like the, I mean, like I, I mean, I mean, my my, you, my head exploded. I'm like, you picked a jury. You went through all of Void Dyer. You picked a jury. You had a complete trial with witnesses and evidence on a life on case. One day, a yes, life case. I have motion hearing transcripts bigger than this trial transcript. And so the problem is, is that we cannot do this assembly line justice, right? Not when we're talking about people liberty and not when we're talking about taxpayers dollars. I also have this belief that the criminal justice system is bloated and I think it's bloated for a reason, right? If we have, if we say we build them, if we build it, they will come. And if we have this system as it relates to individuals in jail, then of course you'll have a crime commission that says, you gotta speed it up, you gotta speed it up. Why? Because we have to fill these jails, right? Because if we don't, then the money goes away and then who are we gonna put into jail, right? So we have to get out of this notion that criminal justice judges, right? Um, because in New Orleans, we have a, a bifurcated system um, that we can, we can gauge their productivity based on how they move cases. I'm really concerned by that concept um, because what it does is it forces judges who then have to be elected to kind of feel like they have to speed it up, right? When a judge is steadily saying, oh, you, your case has been on my docket for this amount of weeks without wanting to have a conversation about how complex the case is or the reason why it's stalling, um, then, I, then I'm concerned, right? And so that's what, when I talk about having active judges, I'm talking about judges who are more in tune to what's going on in the criminal justice system rather than how people are looking at them and, and, and their next election, right? This is why some people disagree um, with electing judges and prefer that judges be appointed. Because as long as the judge is thinking about, I have to be elected in six years, then there's that extra added pressure from the press and people like the Crime Commission that's going to make them want to do this thing like sliding people through the system. So when you talk about a 17-year-old kid um, being on trial for his life, we're not talking about a, a case of possession of cocaine or marijuana. We were talking about a murder case where I have cases where I went to trial for drugs that were that lasted longer than this murder case. Um, then we, we have a problem with the system. And then the judge who sat there is now the district attorney. <laughs> The problem and that problem is saying that we're okay with this system. We're not really active in how we elect judges and how we elect actors in, a, in the system. And I'm going to get back on track because I keep staying off track. But okay, sorry. Uh, but no, that's don't be sorry. This is a fascinating conversation. <laughs> but it's like it almost it almost begs the question: Why don't we have a separate metric of how many times have the appellate courts overturned you and how many? wrongfully convicted people have you presided over as judge as an alternative to the crown commission's metric because i mean i'm telling you if you look at if if the ultimate decision right now is i i am i am the mcdonald's of judges and i'm just popping these cases out as quickly as possible but then you look at the fact that every case you touched ended up in appeal all those appeals lasted with cases that were in the system in the system perpetually for dozens of years and cost mm -hmm. taxpayers millions of dollars maybe there should be a metric of how much money did your decision cost the system because mm -hmm. maybe that's a fair a fair comparison because right now you're right i mean 
I've always kind of been dubious with all these grading systems as a legislator, like, oh, I got an A from law B. What the hell does that mean? It means mm -hmm. I voted against all the unions the whole time. That's mm -hmm. what it means. I'm an anti-union mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. But like with the crime commission, using Jerome Morgan as an example, you get an A for them for lock for, for having a one day murder trial. You get like an A plus, like a like an extra credit because you mm -hmm. rushed. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna my rest of my day might be my brain <laughs> imploding over the idea that a 17 year old had a murder trial with jury selection in a single day, and a judge didn't say, "Whoa, let's break for lunch." <laughs> let's break for lunch. Could I, could I say you know, I was I was equally equally impressed, and I, and I tell people this all the time uh, by the defense attorney on the case. Right? Um, you know, we have to hold everybody in the system accountable. Right. Not enough to just say bad DA, bad DA, bad judge, bad judge, but we have to hold defense attorneys accountable too. Right. Um, and, and so that's that notion of. We have to learn how to do this differently because we have evidence that the way we're doing it doesn't work, right? People will say, oh, do you think the judges on the court are bad? Absolutely not. What I do believe is that we have been doing this so long, right? That when you take the bench, you just continue to do the same thing. And what I'm saying is that we need to have conversations and we need to change because we now have evidence that what we have been doing for so long don't work. Why? We're still not safe in our city. We still incarcerate the most people and we're still exonerating a lot of people. So to me, those three things alone, I can add a whole gravy list of other things, um, say that there is a problem with our system and we can't keep ignoring it, right? We can't keep saying, oh, next time, oh, the next DA will take care of it. The next judge will take care of it. It's time to look at the system as whole and have a conversation about how to do it better. And so I'm kind of excited that the conversation is happening. Like even if I, I November 3rd comes and I'm not elected, I, I, I am hopeful that people are now thinking about this notion of a more just fair system that also keeps our city safe. We don't have to jeopardize the safety of our system, uh, city to have a, a, a just system. Right, and I mean, what, one more question before I go to the next one, I'm gonna stop digressing, but what, which public defender system was Jerome Morgan under? The old one or the new one? I'm just curious. The old one, of course. Of okay. Course. And, and if you know the history yeah, of Canizero yeah. and the DA and the defense attorney in there, you know that 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 was one of the big problems. You know um, that you had these public defenders assigned to the section. Um, Canizero had been it had been exposed that he was giving some of his judicial funds, like bonuses, to the de public defenders in that section. Um, but this didn't stop the system from doing what it what it always do, right? It was kind of like we'll smack your hand, but we'll continue to do what we do. So, no, but 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 to, but, to, but to the point, the big reform that happened that you oh, absolutely the system, what was that was that once you stop letting public defenders have a side gig, mm -hmm. then the full commitment was to doing the public defender job. When you oh, when you had the old system, because I was I was public defender under the old system, and mm -hmm. I guess I was too poor and whatever i just did public defender work full time because i just was a new lawyer and didn't have a side gig really but like mm -hmm. you'd have people that would come in there in the old system and they would do their time like i gotta be here for three hours to process these mm -hmm. cases but their more lucrative side gig was to be a lawyer somewhere else so i could imagine, see imagine that if system. your side gig was working for the judge to get these cases <laughs> off the socket imagine if that was your side gig so to, to, to your to your point i think at the reforms at the, at the office where you made the primary job being the public defender, mm -hmm. then that's in that same situation that that lawyer is not in a rush to get back to his other gig. Absolutely. He's there saying, my job is to make sure this guy gets his four or five day trial so that, and plus, like you said, the other thing when you're talking about the length of dockets, people who don't understand the system don't understand the fact that you have non-cooperative witnesses. Let's mm -hmm. say you're a public defender. I used to be, I only did magistrates. I didn't do nearly the breadth of what you did, but like, if you've got, if you're rushing a trial, what if I can't find my witnesses? What if my mm -hmm. witnesses are hiding from me? And mm -hmm. you're saying our trial is in four weeks. Well, it has to if, go. If, 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 if I'm, if I, if I've got a witness that'll prove my client's innocence and I can't find them, but you've got a hard trial date, you're penalized just for existing. Anyway, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. not going to rent anymore. Okay, <laughs> I think we your judicial philosophy. If someone comes in front of Judge Nandi Campbell. As a as a prosecutor, defendant, as a public defender, 
as a court watch person, whoever, what can they expect their experience will be like in your court? So the first thing is, it's not my court. It's the it's the public. Great court. answer. <laughs> That's the first notion. And once we start uh, with that foundation, it, it continues. The second thing is that the courts are supposed to be a place where the Constitution always comes first. So we have to believe in this notion of innocent until proven guilty, and, and we move from there. I expect um, everybody in my courtroom to be transparent. Um, it, it's important that the public understands because the courtroom belongs to them what's going on. I want to be transparent in all of my rulings and give some explanation um, so that my rulings are not dissected by the media or, or explained by the media. I believe that the public, I owe that to the public since I'm working for them. Um, it will be a case where we will meet safety and, and, and balance that um, um, with upholding defendants' rights. I think that's important. And when people ask me, like, you know, shouldn't safety be the most important things? I always point to the beginning of the criminal justice system that's NOPD. And so what we will have from a judge in Section G, if it's Nandi Campbell, is that you'll have ongoing conversations with every agency in the criminal justice system. So I want to be transparent. I want to be a communicator and a connector. And I want to make sure the public understands that Section G belongs to them. And I work for them. And I expect them to grade my paper all the time and I won't come to ask them for grading just every six years okay um I think you've already hit on this but let's 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 in case you've left something on the table as a practitioner and as a potential judge what are your thoughts on the state of the judiciary at Tulane and Broad in criminal district court so I think that um the the the, the big problem the state of the judiciary um, at criminal district court is they, they, they don't understand or know how to work with the fact that the public defender's office is underfunded severely, right? And when you're dealing, when you're a judge and you're dealing with the system uh, with these huge inequities, then you, you have to be able to address it in a way um, to ensure that the defendants are being represented right, right? So I think that the judges currently are doing what they're doing under a system that they know, right? And I would like um, it to be a situation where judges are, are constantly talking about creative ways to be partners with other agencies in the system. I don't see enough partnerships, right? And I'm not sure, especially in the last 12 years with the district attorney's office, that the blame lies with the judges. I think that partially um, a lot of it lies with the introduction of how Canazero started his regime, right? Um, and I don't know if you remember, he kind of turned all of the judges into the AG's office for having illegal. Oh, that's right. With, right? with, 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 so, the, with the health insurance, he kind of- Exactly, he kinda, something you, that you, he benefited from, right? So right. that was kind of like, hello, let's work together. It was kind of like, hello, I'm here and I'm going to ding y'all. So I, I don't believe that's a way to kind of say, let's have this type of relationship. And so what I propose and what I believe and that will help the state of judiciary currently is to make sure that we are having um, open communication with every agency that's involved in the system, right? It's kind of weird when it's disjointed and NOPD don't understand that judges have been suppressing a lot of evidence, right? Because they rely on the DA to tell them, right? Where this, this information should have come from somebody on the bench. A lot of judges use this opportunity or the canons to say, I can't, I can't do this, right? And I think it's more beneficial to use the canons uh, to dictate what you can do and what not what you can and not to. Okay. Um, let me get your stance on a couple of issues that I think will be very important to uh, any judge at criminal district court. What is your position on the cash bail system? And if you're against it, how would you modify or change it? So the cash bail system is, is oppressive. It, it definitely punish uh, the indigent, um, the, the hardworking middle-class people who have to live paycheck to paycheck. Um, service industry people um, are penalized by the system. Um, I think that the default, especially for nonviolent crime, should be ROR. And then we should have a hearing about why it should not be ROR. Right, um, and, and that's the reverse of what we have. Um, the statute um, dictates that you can use ROR, and I think that it's not utilized enough. Um, and so you should be granted an ROR unless the state could dictate that you're either um, uh, 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 unsafe for the society or yourself, 
and or you have a history of meeting, missing court. And whatever conditions um, is needed to ensure that the person comes back, I think ROR should be a default. And then a lot of times for crime or violence, what will happen is because the DA has a lot of time to accept the case, you will have people accept it, you'll have people arrested for a crime of violence and they sit in jail sometimes for 120 days. Um, and then the DA might refuse to charge us. And then that person go home, they lose their house, they lose their job. Um, you know, a lot of times their family have, have been uh, dislocated because they're the primary breadwinner of the household. Um, I think if somebody is arrested for a crime of violence, a bond should be set based on um, the several factors um, that, that are dictated in the statute, not just what they're charged with. I want to know, um, does he have any priors? I want to know what his ties to the community is. I want to know the facts of the case. Um, and I think that judges, commissioners should automatically set it for a preliminary hearing, right? We can't like do this one size fit all system. Um, I wanna know, I think that I've represented some women who were defending themselves and, and, and they murdered their boyfriends, right? I, I want some information about this because I don't necessarily think uh, this woman should sit in jail for 120 days. I think that that might re-victimize her. I think that maybe she should be home, seeing a counselor, being with her family. Like I want more information about the case. So the bond, um, which is required by statute, um, it's based on information about the case and not just because NOPD decided to charge a person. Well, and I think it's, it's also important because I remember when I was a magistrate, judges don't revisit bonds nearly enough either. Like if you set a high bond for someone and you have that magistrate judge just that initial bond when they do that initial hearing, as more information comes in and a public defender wants to have that bond reheard, at least when I was there, this was, God, this was like 2006, this was a while ago, but you had a reticence by judges to go, well, I don't really don't want to hear that bond again. I already set that one. I want to go to the next one. It's like, well, someone's already been in jail for a month and there's more information and you want to rehear a bond. As a judge, do you think that, as a potential judge, do you think judges should more frequently revisit bonds as more information comes in? So two things, I want to talk with the judges about changing the system. So we start a lot in cases based on the date of arrest. Um, they had done that before, and I think that's a great way to allot cases to allow judges to start participating in the cases sooner ra rather than later. I also think that if an individual is charged with a crime of violence, a preliminary hearing should automatically be set, right? Yeah. Currently, you have to wait for the defense attorney to file, um, but at bond setting, you have to state there, you have a defense attorney there, it should be set, right? Um, that way, an individual does not have to wait to get in touch with their public defender for them to file it and then wait seven days. So we should get in the habit of setting uh, preliminary hearings and bond hearings so that the judge can hear more information and adjust the bond accordingly. Especially, like I have individuals who sit in jail for 120 days and have things that, uh, refused. I mean, can you imagine? I couldn't imagine like giving up four um, months of my life um, to just kind of skip out, you know, walk out of jail. Saying, oh, but, but, it's but, refused. You, but, but, and I think it's, it's even worse because refuse doesn't mean they're not going to charge you again later. It just Absolutely. means, it just means I haven't got my shit together. So you get to leave, but Absolutely. I still reserve the right that after you've spent four months in jail, I may come back six months later and still charge you. <laughs> I had an individual, his parents turned me in, he turned him into me a day after his high school graduation. He waited two and a half years for his trial, found not guilty. Uh, during a time when he was in jail, sitting on a million dollar bond, he had no priors. His father passed away. All of his friends went off to college. Like his life had drastically changed in those two and a half years. I think that we don't understand what happens to individuals who are in jail. There's, there's a physical impact, there's a psychological impact, and this is something they just don't get out once they walk outside of the jail. And if they, we cannot say they're a danger to the society or there's no conditions that ensure the safety of the community, we really should talk about why we house people in jail. There's no information that says it makes us safer and or defer or, or, or prevent anything from happening in our society. So, I mean, the amount of money we spend on housing individuals pre-trial is ridiculous too and needs to be addressed. Okay, so... Mandatory minimums. Uh, obviously, uh, you've experienced them as a public defender. You've experienced triple bills, multi bills. As a judge, what will your position be on mandatory minimums? So, um, 
you know, mandatory minimums are in the statute. So as a judge, I have to follow the law. Um, there are times where under some certain circumstances, um, a judge could say, I, I just don't believe that the mandatory minimum should be followed in this case. And so there is a case called Dorothy that basically allows um, judges to dictate that they're going below the minimum, but they have to provide a sufficient uh, a reason for it, right? Um, the the, the multi-bill statute, um, it flies against our whole notion of you do the crime, you do the time, right? So we, right. you know, when you're in grade school, they tell you things like that. And so if you if you go and you do your time and you get out, um, then that, that's not true. It could come back and bite you, so to speak. Um, they're also oppressive when you use them for nonviolent crimes, because basically what you're doing is punishing an addiction or illness, right? Um, so if you are middle to upper class and you have an addiction, you get the privilege of going inside rehab and you might have family support. Um, and, and you might have great insurance. And so you don't have to deal with what I call the penal rehabilitation, right? And so this is a, a example of why the poor and the indigent is, is oppressed by this system because they don't have those options, right? And so mandatory minimums and, and the use of the habitual offender statutes um, have a severe impact on people of color, um, and, and, and people, indigent people. And, and, and I think that um, the use of it, especially in New Orleans, have been um, overly burdensome on our system, on, on the criminal justice system as a whole, um, and on the number of people we incarcerate. Um, so I think that judges should be utilizing um, their, their bench to identify cases where, where Dorothy fits. I'm not saying that they should go and use it on every case, um, but they should be having conversations with the district attorney's office about the use of the habitual offender statutes. Um, they should be informing the public um, when these crazy sentencing come out um, about why the sentence would, had to be that way, right? And put that ball back um, in the DA's court so that he could explain the use of the habitual offender statute. Um, and they could do it in a way where, where it comes with the order. When you sentence someone, you're able to provide reasons why you had to sentence this person. And I think judges should be very vocal um, about why they sentence a person one way or another, whether it's an aggravating is information or mitigating information, um, because that's part of being transparent. I mean, when, when you see the headlines, oh, this judge sentenced someone to 100 years for this, um, people often bash the judge. And one of the reasons they bash the judge is the judge is not doing a good job as, at educating the public. And, and I think that's one of our responsibilities. Well, and it's interesting because people really don't understand how DA discretion works. Mm -hmm. And to your point, I mean, I spent a lot of time beating my head against the marijuana statute, but marijuana first, second, third, that whole nonsense, which I sort of mm -hmm. fixed, but still ridiculous. But the fact that if you're a rich person, you can get marijuana first 8,000 times. If you're a poor person, you go one, two, three, felony. Yeah. And I mean, it's amazing with habitual offender and multi-bill, that's DA discretion too. A DA can go like, you're a nice kid. I'm not going to triple bill you. I don't have to. So I'm just mm -hmm. not going to do it. And it's always been kind of ridiculous because judges, the problem the burden I see on judges is you'll be in your courtroom and you'll see that happen in front of you. You'll see a person mm -hmm. get triple billed right in front of you. And then the next person who shows up with their private lawyer, probably a two lane, two lane student, probably from not from New Orleans, got lots of money. They've mm -hmm. done the same thing. They have a similar record, but they're in a multi bill because the DA has a discretion mm -hmm. to not do that. And I mean, I appreciate what you're saying because if a judge can point that out and say, listen, listen, public, you're in my courtroom. This person got triple billed. That, per mm -hmm. that person didn't. They have the exact same record. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of accountability judges can bring to DAs to go, this is kind of, this is kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to point it out when it happens. Every time. Another thing is I think that um, judges <laughs> need a little more power. I, I was talking to my legislative friends and People don't understand that judges can't dismiss a case. It's, no, a, it's one of the things, when I came here, I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Um, and, and so we don't even trust judges to be able to call a case like it is and say, 
this is crazy. Even though judges hear the most information about the case, like right. the case review it, um, but the judges are privy to what the defense attorney has to say. They're privy to eyeballing the defense. Um, they're privy to un seeing the defense family. Um, so there, there are cases where you could see that this case should not take up any more time. Um, there's a situation this young man probably needs some help. The arrest alone might have scared him straight. Um, <laughs> and so the fact that the judge can't just say, you know what, I'm going to dismiss this case, stay out of trouble for two years and go about your way. And so I think that that is um, something we have to work on as it relates to legislators to kind of give some leeway to judges to make some of these hard decisions. Excuse well, and, and that, would, <laughs> that would certainly improve your Metropolitan Crown Commission score. If you're just dismissing cases that are ridiculous left and right, you'd be real efficient. Mm -hmm. But, but um, okay, so death penalty. Uh, obviously, as a criminal court judge, you'll be faced with situations where the prosecution was death penalty. I know that I want to bifurcate this question. What is your personal position on the death penalty? And what is your judge position on the death penalty? Well, so my personal position is that I'm against the death penalty. I think that it's crazy living in a country where we get hammered in, thou shall not kill, thou shall not kill, <laughs> if you're the government. Um, and so I have serious problems with that. Um, and so as a judge position, it's, it's legal in Louisiana. And if the DA elects, um, to, to charge someone with first degree capital, um, then I will have to sit um, and, and, and go through it and I, I will be able to do it. But once again, I'm going to do it in the same spirit that I'm going to do a, a marijuana trial or a cocaine trial to ensure um, that this individual rights are protected um, because I don't think that we should promote a system where we're just pushing people through and do over. I know that it's expensive, especially death penalty cases are extremely expensive. And, and if not done right, then they're coming back and, and, and we need to be cautious about that. So if I'm forced to do it, I can do it. I can be fair, I'm a rule follower. Um, um, but I, I think that the people of New Orleans have spoken about their beliefs on the death penalty. Um, and and I, I, I just hope that we continue this trend of not, not having them. Okay, uh, next up we have judicial activism. Let me kind of define that. So you have two schools of thought about judicial activism. You have people who they believe judges should stay in their lane. They should only interpret the law using case law the way it's been interpreted since the beginning of time. And they should not deviate from case law whatsoever. So if basically if other judges in the Fifth Circuit, Fifth Circuit Federal Court, terrible, we'll put that out there. I'm just gonna say that. I don't do quite much federal practice, but they're terrible. When it comes to criminal cases. If the Fifth Circuit says it's allowed, it's the way it should be, even if you think it's unconstitutional as a judge, you should follow the case law and jurisprudence. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought is you're an elected judge. You can interpret the laws like anyone else can. And if you think the law has been interpreted incorrectly since the beginning of time, you have the wherewithal and ability as a judge to make your own interpretation. Where do you think you fall in that spectrum? And you can give kind of more details. That's, on that. great. That's a great question. I fall sort of in the middle, right? I, I think that uh, we have this great um, thing called the Constitution, right? And I think that we have to admit that people who, who analyzed the Constitution and, and applied it to some cases prior to us might have been living in a different society, had a different thought process, or didn't have this particular case in front of them. And when I talk about treating people as individual and looking at each individual case, that's when I, I start to discuss judicial activism, right? And so for me, um, I, I cannot sit here and say, oh, I'm just gonna follow the fourth to the letter of the law um, because I don't, I'm not sure if citing a 1920 case in a 2020 case, um, it should be applicable, right? If, if, if the constitution, would uphold both decisions. Does that make sense? No, um, it, makes, it makes complete sense. Cause I mean, we, we had lots of instances where, um, I'll give you an example in the legislature, um, revenge porn. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's the whole idea oh. that like, like your, your ex-boyfriend, you're jilted. So exactly. you go find some, some porn video, you put a deep fake of your girlfriend on it, put it, look, give my girlfriend a porn video. Look, I got her. There were plenty of opportunities, as I saw it as a practitioner, as a lawyer, where you could look at existing statute and the and the and the spirit of the statute to give mm -hmm. people recourse to say, no, mm -hmm. this is slander, this is liable, this is all kinds of different things that 
existing statute would cover to give women some relief from this horrific practice. Mm -hmm. Judges just refused to do it. They said, because the statute does not say technology, it does not say mm -hmm. internet, we're doing nothing. So mm -hmm. we had years where women were going through this drama in civil court, criminal court, wherever, where no one would touch it because they were like, we don't have a statute on point. The legislature has to pass a bill to specifically address this issue, which we ultimately did. But the point is, is that if you look at criminal statute across the country, it's drawn broadly enough on purpose to try and meet time. So but see if you call these judges activist judges, right? Also kind of <laughs> prevents them from wanting to do it because they look at that word activist to be like a bad thing. Like, oh no, I can't. Because once again, they're thinking about six years down the line, I have to be reelected. I represented two teachers who um, found out that some kids had a video of a sex act right. and wanted to make sure this video didn't get out. Um, and so they transferred the video and they didn't want to lose the video for investigation purposes. They transferred the video um, from the kid's phone to their phone and then deleted it from the kid's phone. And guess who was arrested in this? The teacher, the teacher, teachers for having kitty right? porn. And so <laughs> this, these, these, this is an example of, you know, a judge saying, you have to be kidding me, right? You, right. you have to, so the statute says, this is what uh, distributing pornography is, right? The, all, all of the elements fit, uh, but for, you have these two teachers trying to protect a bunch of kids, right? Right. So we can't look for uh, legislators to put every exception in the statute. That's when your brain, your experience, your life experience, your knowledge is supposed to kick in and say, I don't need it to have an asterisk saying, J uh, except for uh, teachers trying to protect. Well, and, and, and then and the problem you have there is that if you make the legislature, the legislature, there's a saying the only time the state of Louisiana is safe is when the legislature is not in session. <laughs> and and the problem is, is that we, let's say we put an exception there for teachers. What happens when a teacher is caught in a sex act with a kid? And we're like, by the way, there's an exception to the law. If they've got the, yeah. form on the thing, but for teachers, it's like, you have to have, I mean, so you I don't think the point. exception should be there. I think <laughs> right. the common so, sense correct. should be on the brain and in the police force. Like we should not have to, always have to see things in black and white. And that, that goes to the importance of electing quality people, appointing quality people, and, and not like just doing this kind of personality um, favorism thing, right? Because these are people who are going to have to make the hard decisions. No, okay, so uh, this was an easy one for you. Do you consider yourself a reform candidate and why? Now, let me give a little context. Everyone, apparently the cycle's a reform candidate. Everybody. I haven't met anybody who said, it. no, no, I am not a reform candidate. I'm for locking everybody it. up. So, I love but, it. but why don't Bring you it. define for me what it reform is and why you're a reform candidate? Because everyone's a reform candidate, apparently. Can you tell me what reform means to you and why you meet that criteria? So reform for me, especially as it relates to the criminal justice system, is for me, it's kind of like the opportunity to do something different. Um, to get where everybody knows we have to go. So I think um, the last six years is, was about having conversations about what was wrong with the system. And these things were highlighted um, by excellent reporting of the lens, uh, court watches, um, some lawsuits by ACLU, blaring examples. I'm um, seeing these young men come home, Robert Jones, Jerome Morgan. We had like 12 years of like bullet points after bullet points of what's wrong with the criminal justice system in New Orleans. And so for me, reform is kind of seeing this stuff and saying, I have a plan to try to do something different, right? And, and not just saying it, um, but, but, but having um, some action um, that you could look at prior to, you can say, oh, Nandi talked about this, Nandi did this, she represented this person. Um, and, and so that's what I see reform as, is the opportunity to do something different, to have a different outcome uh, um, as it relates to a full system. People will say, well, you're just gonna be a judge. You, you, you have no say on anything other than what happens in your courtroom. And so for me, um, part of the reform, reforming the system is the ability to have conversations with, with people in other agencies that affect the criminal justice system. One of, the, one of the biggest problems I think is that we have all of these agencies and there's no kind of cohesive 
um, joint plan or, or action or conversation, right? That's transparent because if they're happening, I don't know about it. I'm not invited to. I don't know of any public realm where we have all of the actors sit and say, this is what we're doing, right? And so I would say I'm a reform candidate in the sense of I have listened, I have observed, I have knowledge of what's wrong with the system, and I intend to actively attempt to change it and have conversations with other people about changing it. I forgot what the second part of that question was. No, you already nailed it. It was like oh, no. naming it and why, why you're a reform cancer. You, you got both of them. Okay, um, so. How's campaign during COVID? <laughs> Woo. So I'm a trial attorney. So I am a, I'm a trial attorney. Juries are my thing. I, I love jurors. And one of the reasons um, my father, he was an activist. He was a, a teacher, really big guy, six, eight. And, and he talked to everybody. When I say, you know, it was, it was eight of us. And sometimes we'll, we'll say, oh, Baba is taking us say to the movies. And so we would have to walk down the street and literally we didn't, it took us an hour and a half to get to the train station because my father would stop and talk to people. And I remember he would give us little tips like, you know, when you talk to people, always shake their hand, look them in their eye. Don't believe somebody who looks away when you ask, you know, so all of this stuff comes to play with me, my character, how I interact with people. And anybody who knows me is I am a people's person. This is what I do. You can find me uh, in, in the streets on the second line. All of my clients have my text, uh, my cell phone number. I interact with people. So this has been pretty hard for me on a personal basis because I really like talking to people. I like sitting on people's porch and just kind of kicking it and, and having conversations about life or having conversations about family. I tell people like, literally all of my clients have become my family. Um, so as far as that is concerned, um, it, it's, it's been really hard for me because that's who I am as a person. It also kind of jogged my creative side, right? And so as a lawyer, because we have all these statutes case law, you become kind of rigid. You become kind of, I got to get the statue. I got to find my motion. So you, you, your, your creative brain only is activated when it comes to trial. I know that's me, right? That's right. when I use my creative brain the most. Um, so during COVID, we had announced, we were first to announce, we announced before COVID, um, which, you know, if I knew COVID was coming, <laughs> uh, but it, it forced us to be creative. And so I really enjoyed kind of like jogging that creative brain of, of mine, right? And kind of uh, re-massaging that. Cause I used to dance and I used to crochet. I used to braid hair. So I, in, in my youth, I, I, I <laughs> tapped into my creative side. And so I had to uh, re-tap into my creative side. Um, uh, you know, the forums have been hard um, because it's, it's more, it's, uh, for me, it's easier to be in person. Um, and, and so, but you adjust, that's, that's what life is, right? Life is about um, taking your circumstances and adjusting um, without just climbing in a hole. I mean, there were, there were days where I felt like, okay, what did I do? Let me go and climb in a hole, but they didn't last um, very long. Um, and I, I knew um, that I was passionate about what I was doing. And so I, I, I continued. Okay. Um, keeping it clean, why are you more qualified than your opponent? Keeping it clean. Oh my keeping God. It, I always say keeping it clean because some people are like, let me tell you about a mama. And it's like, I don't want to hear about a mama. <laughs> I just want to hear why you think. Because obviously, if you're running, if someone's running against you, you're running against them. There's a reason you think you're more qualified than they are for the of position. Course. Just so I, I know there's a few, there's a few, you know, there's a few things. Um, you know, I'm more qualified. I, I feel like I've been active in this community recently more than he has. He touts 22 years of experience um, and, and touts that he is from New Orleans as the two reasons um, that people should vote for him. Um, I have been uh, doing this work consistently and solely criminal law. Um, that means that I don't have a mixed practice. So this is my specialty. Um, I have had relationships with judges um, to a point where I have never been disciplined um, by a judge. Um, and I think that's important to note. Um, and, and that's not true of my opponent. Um, I have uh, uh, worked ethically uh, for 12 years um, to the point that I have never ever received a bar complaint, not even a gar bar complaint. And I haven't been disciplined by the bar, um, not a, a slap on the wrist, not a suspension um, and, and not a disbarment. And I, I think that's a testament um, to the fact that I appreciate 
my being here because of the work from my ancestors. So it's important for me to act and move ethically. Um, I have 16 nieces and nephews. So it's really important uh, for me to be a role model for them. Um, I also think that it's important that I've been asked to teach at the law schools. I think that's important. Um, that means that I have acted and conducted myself in a manner um, that, that not one, but two law schools um, let me near their students and <laughs> allow me to teach them. And I think that's huge. Um, and so my personal character and my business character um, is aligned um, with what, what we need on the bench. Um, Section G has been without a judge for a year and a half. And I was talking to Justice and Beyond yesterday because the hearings um, for, for uh, the lady who's been nominated for a Supreme Court started yesterday. And I was thinking like, what, what if we had a system where people, um, people pick their local judges um, with just as much gusto and, 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 and review as, as we expect of our US Supreme Court judges. Um, and, and I think it's important that people do their research. And I think that if you do, um, it's really, really clear um, the differences between me and my opponent. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we go today? Uh, and don't forget to plug your website and your Twitter and all your stuff, gonna, everybody does. I'm gonna do here. well. I'm gonna do all that, but I I just want like so. There has been a, a theme about me not being from here, and so people think that I came down here. I did come down here to work for the public defender's office, but I like to tell a story about my sister. I used to work in banking, and my sister um, is a doctor, and we would find conferences that were scheduled to be in New Orleans so that we could always find a way to come down <laughs> to be for law school. And we ended up meeting a lady, I'll never forget this, when you got off the plane pre-Katrina and you was a tourist, they will always tell you to stay in the French Quarter, don't leave Canal Street, like don't go anyplace else. And I remember one time we met a lady who was working in Woolworth and she gave us her address and said, you should come over, I'm gonna feed y'all, I'm gonna cook y'all some food. And we were like, so excited. This is a nice older lady. And we got in a taxi and we gave him the, the address, right? And he turned around and he said, no, y'all can't go to this address. I now know that it was in the Iberville projects, right? <laughs> cannot go. And we insisted, we insisted and um, met this Miss, Miss Jan. And um, every time we came down, Miss Jan, would, would cook for us. Um, and so, you know, I came for a job. I stayed because of the people, the culture, the love of the city. Um, I brought my house in Central City because I wanted to be kind of close to the people, close to the action. Um, and, and so this notion um, that if you're not from here, you can't understand and want to change something about the city is ridiculous. Um, and and I'm, I'm excited and happy about my decision. I never question it. Uh, at all. And, and so I just want people to know that. So my website is www.nandicampbell.com. And the reason it's nandicampbell.com and not Nandi for Judge is because I didn't want to have to change my website um, if I decide to run for president. So I, I <laughs> just my name, www.nandicampbell.com. And social media, it's elect Nandi Campbell. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been a great conversation today. I really enjoyed it. I really look thank forward you. to seeing you on the campaign trail virtually six to 12 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Bye -bye. No problem. Bye.